Welcome back, guys. My name is Nick. This is Conjunction Press. We've got to talk about Aleister Crowley. Crowley is one of these figures that everybody has heard something about, but nobody really knows anything about. And I'm a huge Crowley fanboy. And so for the next little while, I'm going to give you a couple of reasons about why you should read Aleister Crowley. So the first reason you should read Aleister Crowley is he was a serious thinker, a serious philosopher in his own right, totally outside of anything to do with magic. Uh, but insofar as magic goes, he had a coherent magical philosophy. Well, what do I mean by that? He developed, or rather was handed, we'll say, a system. Uh, do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Love is the law. Love under will. And a lot of people hear that and they say, oh, that means do whatever you want, right? Wrong. What that means is you have to find your true will, right? Your divine will. He talks about this quite a lot in his writings. And in order to do that, you have to basically perfect yourself or, or aspire towards perfection of yourself, right? So why do we perfect ourselves? Why do we aspire towards perfection? We have to love ourselves and love our environment enough to care about how we are functioning within it and to care about how the environment itself will progress. And so do what thou wilt should be the whole of the law, right? So finding our divine will and then doing it is the law, right? But love is the law, love under will. So there's this weird bit at the end, love under will. What does that mean? So it means will is an emergent phenomenon. So in order for us to have our true will and to be able to find it, what it means and what it is, and, and sort of spill it out into the world, we first have to love ourselves and our world enough to dedicate time to the pursuit of the perfection of the self. So Crowley's magical philosophy talks about you have to be good at a couple of sports, you have to be well-versed in mathematics, you have to be well-versed in science, you have to be a well-rounded and well-put-together human being before you even get into the magical stuff. So reason number one you should read Crowley is because he had a well-thought-out and serious magical philosophy uh, aside from other things. Reason number two you should read Aleister Crowley. Uh, he is so seriously misunderstood, and a lot of that is actually really funny. Uh, so he'll make these ridiculous jokes in his writings that are will go way over the head of people at the time because you got to remember Crowley is writing in this period in Victorian England where it is totally not okay to be gay, right? So Alan Turing cracks the Enigma code and basically helps win the war against the Nazis, and the British government chemically castrates him. So like that's that's the environment Crowley is writing in. So you got to understand like he. He was transgressive on a bunch of different levels. He was a bisexual man in England where that was like illegal and sinful and looked down upon. Uh, he was really into drugs in a world where that was, you know, weird and sort of the providence of witches. And uh, he, he was pegged as the wickedest man in the world because he was so transgressive and, and revolutionary for his time that a lot of people didn't even know what to do with him. So uh, in his writings, this will come off in, in hilarious and often misunderstood ways. So there's this one great passage where he talks about the sacrifice of a male child with a high IQ. And he says he does this like 150 times a year. And everybody is aghast at this, right? Oh my God, a sacrifice of a male child with a high IQ. But he's making this masturbation joke. Uh, it, it's all about masturbation and climax and, and using the energy of climax to uh, ride the wave of, of that energy and to perform a magical working based on that energy. And, and so he'll, he'll intersperse stuff like that throughout the text all the time. Uh, he's got these great jokes that if you're a keen Crowley reader, you can pick up on the subtleties of his humor um, and it, it can be a good time. Uh, reason number three, you should read Aleister Crowley. Uh, his influence on the modern magic world can't be overstated. Um, Wicca, the charge of the goddess from the Wiccan system, lists directly from Crowley's Book of the Law, uh, almost word for word. Uh, Scientology emerges because L. Ron Hubbard is hanging out with Jack Parsons, who is a disciple of Aleister Crowley. Uh, the Lima is basically sparks a ma modern magical revival. Um, Crowley's work with the Golden Dawn uh, facilitated uh, Israel Regardi's involvement in some regard, but you know Regardi's a luminary in his own right. But um, the Golden Dawn is passed on because Israel Regardi uh, publishes the great papers that Crowley already sort of published in the Equinox, but Regardi compiles them and. And does whatever. So, so Crowley is responsible for basically the the Western revival in terms of magical thinking in the 20th uh, century, and he, even so far as to the 21st century. You know, the Beatles have him as a figure on the cover of Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. So, like, this guy was big. He was a big influence in the world, and to not read him because of a, a presupposition about what he's about uh, does a disservice to anyone who's looking to understand more about magic and to anyone who's looking to understand more about sort of the history of the Western uh, occult movement. So, uh, reason number four one should read Aleister Crowley is because his writings are genius. Uh, there's, there's no other real way to say it. You know, the dude spoke 
a ton of different languages. He was well versed in mathematics. He he knew everything there was to know about Hermetic Kabbalah. He had this ridiculous correspondence system. I mean, at the time, this guy this guy was a walking dictionary. Uh, his his writings on magic in Magic Libre ABA in Book Four are unbelievable. They're they're sublime. I I can't recommend that book enough. And then he wrote this book, uh, Magic Without Tears, that can be difficult to get a copy of, but it is so profound and succinct and clear in its explanation of magical phenomena that it, it's one of these gems that any serious practitioner should put in their library. Uh, reason number five, uh, people should read Alistair Crowley, is he's actually not a bad guy at all. Uh, everybody, well, okay, let me contextualize that. For the time, Crowley, definitely one of the good guys. Uh, he's a libertine. He's all about personal freedom. He's got this great quote, every man and woman is a star to each their own orbit. So nobody's allowed to like violate another person's orbit or another person's liberty. You can't take that away. That was like a guiding principle of his. Uh, and, and so, you know, you have to, you have to put this contextually because at the time, you know, he's racist, he's sexist, he's largely anti-Semitic. Uh, there are these things that go into him that are really uncomfortable, but for someone who is preaching liberty and the pursuit of truth and uh, all about avoiding the excesses of hatred and government and corruption, he, he takes, he's very opposed to fascism. He's very opposed to communism. He takes shots at democracy just because it's, uh, it seems to be failing at the time. You got to understand the turn of the 20th century. Uh, things were getting a little strange, uh, particularly after um, the Soviet Union sort of started to do its thing uh, and, and into the 30s as well. You know, there's a there's a whole experience where for a moment the Western world thinks, oh, wow, communism might not be uh, might not be the worst. You know, the Great Depression is pretty hardcore. So uh, Crowley, Crowley, in that sense, was a tremendous thinker and and to miss out on his philosophy uh, is a shame. So but reason number six, you should read Alistair Crowley. Um, his conception of truth aligns largely with our modern conception as, as far as pragmatism goes. So William James has this notion that uh, truth is only true insofar as it affects your relationship to reality. Uh, and Crowley was much the same way. He, he saw magic through a scientific lens. He wasn't dogmatic about it at all. It was, you know, try the experiment and if it works, refine it. If it doesn't work, inquire as to why, and then try again. And so Crowley was was anti-dogma in all of his stances, and for a free thinker, it's definitely worth uh, worth checking out. Um, reason number seven, people should read Alistair Crowley, is uh, he inspired Timothy Leary to a degree that the modern counter countercultural movement um, is still sort of working with. Uh, if, if Leary and Wilson and uh, even Terrence McKenna, to some degree, hadn't been cued in to Aleister Crowley, the, the modern psychedelic world would be totally different. Uh, the modern pursuit of mind-altering states and what they can offer to benefits of life uh, would be totally different. Because Crowley was one of these first pioneers in mescaline and nitrous and hashish in the drugs that were available to him at the time. Uh, he was a pioneer psychonaut before, you know, this is before Hoffman uh, and Fence LSD. This is before Gordon Wasserman uh, is doing mushrooms in Mexico. This is before uh, Timothy Leary and Ramdas are uh, experimenting at Harvard. That like Crowley was like the precursor to these guys uh, hanging out, and so so he's just he's worth reading from that perspective alone. Um, so the next and perhaps last reason for this video you should read uh, Alistair Crowley is he was a brilliant poet. Um, he was prolific. He wrote uh, a poetry that is oftentimes sublime and oftentimes extraordinarily crude. Uh, but as far as a literary contribution to the poetic world goes, uh, he was not one dimensional in any sense at all. And his poetry, well, I think uh, is, let's, let's say I think is interesting. It, it's worth reading just because of its novelty uh, for anything else. So, uh, but, but, you know, let's, let's just, we'll give one more reason. Number nine uh, to read Alistair Crowley is that, there are so many wonderful stories that surround him and his teachers and his co-magicians and sort of the Golden Dawn and the OTO and all this stuff in general. And it, it, it's fun to just get a history of what's going on because when you contextualize what's happening, like Jack Parsons, right? He's a rocket scientist and he, he basically, uh, he would 
B, the impetus for the JPL, uh, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, which is a now a branch of NASA and, and works for, um, you know, put stuff in space, right? But it it's, was joked about that it was called JPL, Jack Parsons Lab. And so this guy, this guy was, was big in that world. And there's this wonderful letter that Crowley writes to the head of the OTO at the time, uh, talking about Parsons and um, L. Ron Hubbard, who would go on to found Scientology. And, and he... He basically calls them ignoramus goats, and uh, there there are sort of like fun things like that where where only Crowley can drop insults. Uh, another wonderful experience is it's called the Battle of Blythe Road, and uh, there's this whole scene where Crowley is trying to basically I, I can't remember he's trying to get grade papers or he's trying to claim a Golden Dawn Temple, which is a magical fraternity uh, in England. He's trying to claim it for him and McGregor Mathers, who was one of the founders of the temple. But there had been a schism in the Golden Dawn, and so. Uh, William Butler Yeats and uh, a couple other folks are there at the time. And Crowley shows up in like dressed in full Scottish regalia. You know, he's got the kilt. He's got the Highlander outfit going on. It's it's absurd. I think he's armed. Like he's got a sword and he comes brandishing his wand and he runs into the temple like sh shouting spells. And uh, Yeats like retreats up the stairs. And when Crowley like runs up the stairs, that Yeats kicks him in the face. And there's this whole, he like tumbles down the stairs and the cops are called. It, it's this whole total ridiculous scene. And uh, Crowley's life is, is stacked with absurd stories like that. So Crowley's worth reading just because his life is weird. And it's fun to kind of get a fictional take on or, or to read real history and to and to think that this could have come out of a novel, how strange it is. So uh, and I suppose at last and certainly not least, uh, reason number 10 to read Alistair Crowley is his grade system in the OTO, or what, um, the AA, yes, uh, and then I guess his influence on the OTO um, are wonderful. And the way he, let's say, breaks down working on the self, working on the, the lower states of consciousness and lower states of the body um, are marvelously comprehensive and causes the individual to explore aspects of themselves that they might not have even had known existed prior to initiation into these fraternities. So, uh, insofar as Crowley goes, he's definitely worth checking out. Uh, I wouldn't miss out on him regardless of whether folks say he's the wickedest man in the world or a Satanist or any of these things. And he certainly wasn't any of these things. He, he decried black magic, although he liked to, uh, use the, the image of Satanism as something that he, he thought was humorous. Uh, so, uh, you know, his mother, I think, called him the Great Beast once when he was a kid, and so he sort of adopted that moniker and became um, just this, like, weird figure. But he uh, he wasn't evil in that sense. You know, he he was a proponent of liberty. He was a proponent of free thought and free love and expression and art and uh, whatever anybody says about him. And there are certain things to say about him. You know, again, racist, sexist, demonstrable. Uh, he, he wrote uh, some pretty pretty hard things in that regard, but... Um, as far as the wickedest man in the world, black magic, baby sacrificing Satanist goes, uh, Crowley was certainly not this. And if anything, he was, let's say on the side of the angels, uh, as much as a Brit from the turn of the 20th century could be. Uh, so I definitely recommend checking him out. Um, particularly his writings on black magic. He, you know, he loathes it. He says it's an unscientific form of magic and that it can be done but he can't imagine anyone stupid or vile enough to to make that uh, a pillar of their magical practice. And so um, insofar as white versus black goes in terms of magic, uh, Crowley was certainly situated on the side of the white magicians. He has, he has wonderful thoughts on three schools of magic, actually, which have nothing really to do with white and black. But um, the notion that his school, how he understood it, was a white magical school. And the goal was to constantly find the limitations of the self, uh, stuff that was holding you back and to push through it and to move in a way that allowed the growth and the expansion of the self and in doing so you would eventually uh, find your true purpose and then that would allow you to live a life that was worth living so uh, those are 10 reasons you should read Alistair Crowley and uh, thanks for hanging in if you stuck with us to the end of the video my name is Nick this is Conjunction Press and we will see you next time